are kicking off our brand new series today. We'll be going through the book of Exodus and just kind of looking at how God delivers. We're calling it freedom from bondage. Uh, life looked bleak for the children of Israel when you, when you open up the book of Exodus and you begin to read through uh, the first chapter. We'll go through chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2 this morning. And we'll see how life looked kind of bleak for them. Uh, during the lifetime of Joseph, the ending of Genesis, Exodus just kind of picks right up with where uh, Genesis left off. During the time of Joseph, the people of Israel had enjoyed freedom. They enjoyed leadership uh, in Egypt. But now they're under a rule of a new pharaoh. There's a new leader in place. And they've been put into uh, bondage. But we know God was not going to leave his people uh, to suffer there forever. And so he protected them. He raises up a man. He raises up a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses, uh, that's going to uh, lead the nation of Israel out of bondage. And so this morning, it only felt appropriate after ending an entire series on grace that this morning we uh, just kind of hook on to where we left off with that. And we're going to talk this morning about uh, being delivered by the grace of God. Being delivered by the grace of God. Uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 1, and let's just read down through the first 10 verses, kind of get an idea of what's happening here, pick up the context of it. Uh, now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, and Gad, and Asher, all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when they're fall without any war, they, also, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. So the people of Israel, they have been put into bondage at this point. All throughout God's word, cover to cover, we see uh, God's power to deliver people out of bondage. Uh, in the New Testament... We see Scripture pointing out how uh, Jesus uh, breaks the power of Satan when he's on the cross, how he delivers us from sin. And we know uh, kind of from Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, where God first promised that there would be a deliverer, one who would uh, come and deliver his people, that Satan's kind of been trying to throw a monkey wrench in that plan the whole time. And there's been attempts to subvert that through the whole time, but we see God constantly showing his power and his deliverance through the Old Testament into the New Testament. Uh, but here in the Old Testament, we know we see some physical deliverance. And God, uh, he delights in delivering people physically. He will deliver people from uh, economic situations. He can deliver people from uh, emotional situations. We know, uh, first and foremost, he wants to deliver us from our spiritual bondage. But as we go through this, we'll see the different types of deliverance that God Offers And he wanted to liberate Israel from more than just their political slavery that they were in. They were in political slavery. They were in uh, economic slavery. They had a, a lot of bad things going on for them. But more than that, he wanted to uh, deliver them because he wanted them to know him and to worship him. And so after Joseph and his family moved to Egypt, things are pretty good for a while. But then things start to kind of turn uh, the opposite direction. Maybe people's hearts begin to turn a little bit from God. And so God wants to get his people uh, out of Egypt. And then I like what John Yates always says in Faith Bible Institute. If you're in Faith Bible, you're familiar with this line. Not only did God need to get uh, his people out of Egypt, but what did God need to do? He needed to get Egypt out of his people. Uh, because Egypt in Scripture is a picture of the world. And we'll see that as we go through there this morning. There's some things in, in their lives that God needs to, to purify and to get out of their lives so they can be uh, true servants for him. And so we'll see that as we go through there. Uh, I like as we think about the book of Exodus, and I'd encourage you to read through the book of Exodus as we're getting into this series. Uh, but Exodus is considered the uh, Old Testament book of redemption. 
the Old Testament book of redemption. We'll see this theme, redemption, over and over again as we go through uh, the book of Exodus. If we read it with, with uh, what one author called Christ-centered lenses, we'll see the, uh, the gospel appearing kind of everywhere in the book of Exodus. We'll see patterns and types and, and pictures of the gospel story of, of redemption as we go through the book of Exodus. We'll see all of these things. Uh, I like what Rod Mattoon said. He said there's several great redemption books in the Bible. The foundation of redemption is seen in this book, the book of Exodus. The foregleam of redemption is viewed in the book of Hosea, as Hosea redeems his wife, another incredible book of the Bible. A lot of times uh, we can overlook it. It gets stuck there in the prophets, and we may not read it, but there's some wonderful stuff about redemption in the book of Hosea. And he says, the fact of our redemption is evident in the gospel of John. And the force of our redemption is displayed in the wonderful book of Romans. We just spent a couple of years here at church going through the book of Romans on Sunday mornings. And that's a blessing. And then the future of our redemption is placed on the table for us to see in the book of Revelation. And so this whole theme of redemption, it kind of just begins and it flows out of this book of Exodus. And we see it woven throughout the scripture, page to page to page, God's redemption. And so we'll see that God not only has the power to deliver us out of our areas of bondage, but he delights in doing it. It delights God to deliver people out of bondage. Now, at the time that we're picking up here, as we read here in the book of Exodus... Kind of one of the first things we got to do is understand uh, who wrote the book of Exodus. Uh, we would think that we could all be on the same page of that. We accept that Moses is the author of the book of Exodus. But you know, that's, pretty, that's a pretty controversial statement to make in a lot of Christian circles today. A lot of people don't believe that Moses was the author of Exodus. I would encourage you to uh, watch. We showed it here a couple of years ago, but there's a documentary called Patterns of Evidence. And a man has done several documentaries now on the book of Exodus... And the last one that he did was based on finding who the author of the book of Exodus was. Uh, we take it as Bible-believing Christians. We believe that it's Moses. Uh, but a lot of so-called Christians would argue with that, and they would say, no, uh, this, is, this is not true history. Uh, a lot of this is made up. A lot of this is uh, just stories that have been handed down. Uh, but as we approach Exodus, we're going to approach this from uh, a literal historical viewpoint, uh, that this is actual history that took place. And Moses, under the inspiration of God, uh, penned what happened at this time. And so we know that Jesus recognized Moses as the author of Exodus. And so if Jesus considers Moses to be the author, we're in pretty good company if we do as well, don't you think? At the time that uh, Exodus was written, uh, Egypt was the prevailing superpower in the world. And this is well before Babylon and Persia rose to dominance. And we see God performing this story of deliverance for his people. Years later, as we go into the book of Joshua, Joshua reminds the people, they had to continually do this. Uh, we'll see this. This will be another pattern that we see through the book of Exodus, how the people quickly forget things. They'd forget a lot about what God had done in their lives. Well, we get into the book of, Ex uh, we get into the book of Joshua, and Joshua has to remind the people of how this great Exodus uh, would serve as an encouragement as they go on to face more battles in life. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 17, uh, the word of God says, For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. He says it was God that, that fought for us. It was God that did this. Uh, uh, this. This wasn't something that we did on our own. We needed the help of God. We, we had no other way out other than God. And so... Here we are at the book of Exodus. It's the second, was we on Wednesday nights, we know Exodus is the second book of what? It's called the, the Pentateuch. Yeah, uh, Exodus is the second book of the Pentateuch. Uh, Egypt, again, is the dominant world superpower uh, at this time. This is centuries before Babylon and Persia would rise to any uh, sort of power. And so the history of Exodus, uh, it begins, and again, this is uh, controversial, talking about the dating in Egypt. 
And a lot of people say, uh, the book of Exodus, you cannot trust it because uh, none of these events actually happened uh, when the book of Exodus says it happened. And so there's a lot of controversy and argument around the, uh, the dating of the book of Exodus. But again, I would encourage you uh, to watch the documentary, uh, Patterns of Evidence. There's one on the Exodus. It will. Yes. Uh, so modernists that want to prove that the Bible is not true uh, will, will try to date things to make it look like the Bible is not true. But as we go through and we see things, we'll know that uh, it actually occurred the way that the Bible says that it has. And it's always good when archaeology and science begins to kind of catch up with what the Bible tells us. And the more that they have uh, studied in the land of Egypt, they have found uh, actual artifacts that back up the Bible's account of how the Exodus played out. And so, uh, of course, we trust it by faith. But it's always nice to know when they can actually find stuff that just proves what we already believe. And so uh, around 1850 B.C., Joseph and the rest of the Israelite tribes, they come into Egypt. Uh, when Joseph was a ruler under Pharaoh, the birth of Moses takes place around 1525 B.C. And then the uh, exodus out of Israel around 1445 B.C. Joseph goes down, you know, the, what's the entire reason? Why do all of these people end up in Egypt? It was because of Joseph. How did Joseph end up in Egypt? His brothers. His brothers hated him. They sent him into Egypt. Uh, and so over the years, a lot of bad things happen to Joseph while he's there. And we finally get to the end of the story. Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20. Joseph tells his brothers, hey, what you guys meant for evil, God meant for good. Uh, a famine hits the, the land. Uh, God's people would have died out had all of these bad things not happened to Joseph where he ended up in a place of persecution, in a place of bondage himself. Joseph ended up in some bad situations. He's falsely accused. He's thrown into prison. But God begins to work through the bad situations, through the bondage in Joseph's life. God begins to work through those situations, and Joseph begins to rise to a position of prominence. And... You know, it's just coincidence, isn't it, that that's just kind of how it worked out, that Joseph ended up in a place where he would be able to, to bring the people of Israel uh, to save them. I mean, that's just really coincidental. Isn't that good that it worked out that way? Right. Or maybe that was God's providence that it worked out that way. It was the providence of God, wasn't it? Right. And so over time, years and years go on, the families of the children of Israel, they grow larger. God continues to bless them. You look at the beginning of the book of Numbers. So they talk about the census that goes on. We have over 600,000 men that are living here at this time, and that's not counting uh, women and children. So we've got over 600,000 people uh, in Israel. Exodus 1-7 tells us the children of Israel were fruitful. They increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding. Mighty in the land was filled with them. But by the time we get to Exodus chapter 8, we see the perils uh, of bondage increasing for the children of Israel. And here's where it begins. It begins first with a hateful culture. Even though they were in bondage, they were growing in number, they were becoming fruitful. But then the spirit of the culture around them begins to change. It begins to change. While they had been tolerated as working slaves... Uh, now they're becoming what this new Pharaoh sees as an intimidating force to be reckoned with just because of their population. And this hateful culture begins because of the fact that uh, the, this Pharaoh was unfamiliar with Joseph. Throughout the years of Egypt's early history, there were many different dynasties. And during the 17th dynasty, the Hyksos dynasty, Joseph comes into Egypt and it's during this time that Joseph is elevated and appreciated. But then we get to the 18th century, and the new king didn't know Joseph. He begins to rule in an evil manner. He's unfamiliar with Joseph and how he had been brought to Egypt. He's unfamiliar with the story of Joseph. He's unfamiliar uh, with God's sovereignty in the story. He's unaware of how Joseph saved the, the nation and the people from starvation through his wisdom. And if we go down to verse number 8 here in Exodus chapter 1, 
I want you to notice this. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. There's something I think that we can learn there, just kind of as a side note. There's a vital lesson. When we fail to teach the next generation God's word and what God has done, we begin a real slippery slope. Uh, It's our responsibility to be teaching the next generation the word of God. It's, it's our responsibility to put a priority on the things of God. And we can look back. You say, why has our culture here in the United States, why has it shifted? Why has it slipped? Why has it changed? Because we'll see some, some similarities between maybe our culture and the culture that the people of Israel were experiencing at this time. Well, maybe the generation before us and the generation before that, maybe the word of God, maybe the things of God became a little less important and people began to teach the next generation fewer things about the word of God and things began to just kind of slip and it becomes less important from person to person. I like, uh, I think it was Warren Wiersbe, he said, neglect of God's word leads to ignorance and the forgetfulness of the next generation. Ignorance of the word leads to sinful living and terrible choices that scar a person's life. And this happens here in Egypt because this has not been handed down, because a new king takes over, because of all of these things he doesn't understand. This pharaoh is going to make some terrible choices. There's going to be some real permanent severe scars on that pharaoh and on his people because he didn't know what had happened, because he didn't know God's word. Rod Mattoon, again, he said, when men do not know Jesus Christ, as the king did not know Joseph, they'll have difficulty in discerning situations correctly. What God calls good, they will call evil. What God condemns, they will commend and justify. Does that sound a lot like our culture that we live in? What's happened? there's not been a passing on of God's word from one generation to the next. It's not become important to us. And the further we go in our lives like that, from one generation to the next, as God's word becomes less relevant to us, the culture goes right along with it. So when we begin to look around at the things going on, we can point our fingers at political adversaries. We can point our fingers at Hollywood and different people like that, but you know whose fault all of this really is? It begins with the church. It begins with Christians. We're the ones who drop the ball. The, 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 the church of God quit passing on the fire to the next generation. And so now we have places like Hollywood and the, the, the liberals that, that are really promoting this, and we can look at them today, and they may be the, the biggest Uh, thorn in in your side at this moment but they're not the ones that started this it began when the people of God lost their ability to pass on the word of God to the next generation and we know bondage in Egypt it's a picture of the sinner spiritual bondage to this world. Uh, Anytime we see Egypt pictured in Scripture from here on, uh, it's never presented as a good thing. When people go down to the land of Egypt, I mean, they they actually went down. You look at the map, the people of Israel went down, and you just draw, again, the similarities, the pictures, the types. The Jews went down to Egypt, uh, and they lived in in the best of the land. I mean, things were great for a season. And then it turned into suffering. And you can just draw the picture in our lives. Scripture tells us that that sin is a pleasure for a season. You can go down to, to spiritual Egypt for a while, and you can enjoy things, and everything might be okay, but then eventually the fun ends. It runs out. And sin promises pleasure and freedom, but what does it do? It does exactly what it did to the children of Israel in Egypt. It brought bondage to their lives. And sorrow. And so, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, it tells us this new king, he's suspicious of the children of Israel. He views them as uh, potential trouble. Though those people of God, they might be causing a problem around here. You know, that's not really all that different from today. All throughout history, 
Christians have been viewed as troublemakers. Uh, In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 24, verse number 5, Paul was referred to as a pestilent fellow. Pestilent fellow. A mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. A ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That's those Christians. That's how the world looks at us today. Because now, the Christians who are still standing firm on the word of God, I mean, we're kind of the ones that are trying to to keep the dam from just breaking, aren't we? We're the ones standing in the way of, of, of keeping whatever those who hate God the modernists, the humanists, the ones who'd like to do away with Christianity, they see us as a problem. It's a hateful culture. And we're beginning to see a hateful culture here in the United States towards Christian ideology, just as the people of Egypt. But again, don't forget that in other parts of the world, there are many Christians who are dealing with just as a hateful culture today as the people of Israel did in the land of Egypt back then. They are really viewed as a real problem, and there are countries that will do what they can to exterminate Christians if they catch you showing your faith openly. You'll be met with a very hateful culture. And even though culture is intolerant towards Christians, and it has been throughout history, this is nothing new, God's people have always survived and multiplied. I mean, you go back to World War II. You go back to the Holocaust. Again, Satan has tried many times to exterminate the people of God. But what is it? Well, God protects his people. And we see it here with the children of Israel. They were growing stronger in the midst of their captivity, not only because... The Pharaoh was unfamiliar with Joseph, but he was also unfamiliar with Jehovah. Uh, The Pharaoh that comes in, this is an idolater. This is a a pagan king. Uh, And the Pharaohs, they they regarded themselves as gods. And the, the whole reason that many of these sins and difficulties existed in Egypt was because uh, Pharaoh, he knew not the Lord. Exodus chapter 5, verse number 2. This is after Moses goes to Pharaoh. He says, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Again, look at our nation. Would you say that our nation is a land that might be a little bit unfamiliar with Jehovah God? It doesn't take much scanning through uh, news headlines to see that our nation, our leaders, are doing everything they can to remove God out of our society. And spiritually speaking, we live in Egypt today, surrounded by a culture that doesn't know Jehovah. Our culture doesn't know the God of the Bible. And that can be discouraging to us. But I want you to think about something. Think about what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 96, verse number 3. This is a great opportunity. He says, declare his glory among the heathen. If we live in a pagan culture today, if we live in a culture that's turned against God, if we live in a culture that's unfamiliar with Jehovah God, we have the opportunity to declare his glory and his greatness and to show people the one true living God. We have the same opportunity that Moses had thousands of years ago to show the wonders of our God. Never forget in your seasons of bondage that God can use you to declare his glory to a culture that doesn't know him. So we can sit as believers and we can can really get distraught and discouraged and we can end up on the sidelines because of how things are going in our culture. Or we can do what the Bible says Say, you know what? Let's get out and let's declare his glory among the nations. Let's get out and declare his glory among the pagans. Let's get out and declare his glory among those who don't know who the one true God is. And then this culture, this Pharaoh, this hateful culture we're talking about, 
He began to be unfair with the people. Verse number 9. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel, they're more and mightier than we. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that they, you know, if a war comes up, they, they'll join against us. And so he's leading in a reactionary manner. The previous pharaohs, you go back to the book of Genesis, when Joseph was there, they welcomed the children of Israel. They encouraged leadership among them. But this pharaoh, he's motivated by fear. He becomes mean and intolerant toward the children of Israel. Verse number 13, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. That phrase means uh, with harshness, with severity. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. I read those verses. Every time I read it, I uh, hear the... uh, Oh, D- DeMille, what was the man's name? The man who produced uh, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston from the 50s. I think they read those verses in there. I always hear that in his voice as he reads those. Yes, Cecil D- uh, DeMille. Uh, so the Egyptians are treating them cruelly. They're whipping them, they're beating them. Uh, and the only materials that they give them to make bricks is uh, straw and mud. In the British Museum, you can find uh, they still have some of the the bricks there uh, as they made them. Joey informed me this morning that the life of a brick is 500 years old, a new brick. This one's over 3,700 years old. Uh, So he says that the lifespan of bricks are, you know, getting worse. I guess they just don't make them the same now as they used to, you know. Uh, We can only get 500 years out of an acne brick. Uh, But... The Egyptians, they burden God's people with harshness. They burden God's people with cruelty. You know, sin, sin does the same thing to us. It burdens us with cruelty. It burdens us with harshness. It will rob us of our joy. It will drain us of our strength. The same way the people of, of Israel felt in the land of Egypt. They were under intense persecution. They're suffering great affliction. But you know, when affliction came into their lives... God had a purpose for it. God had a purpose for it. And just like God had a purpose for the affliction in their lives, you know what he has? He has a purpose for the affliction in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 20 says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day, God is always working. He was working in the life of Joseph when Joseph experienced bondage, when Joseph experienced affliction, when Joseph experienced persecutions. God was working. And when the people of Israel experienced bondage and slavery and persecution and cruelty in this hateful culture, God was still working, and God had a purpose, even though at the time they probably didn't see God's plan unfolding. And we can get down on and say, man, what a lack of faith. But how many times in our own lives do we go through problems and we also fail to see God's plan unfolding? We're kind of blind to that. And it's good to remind ourselves we don't just need to look at what's right in front of our face because God has a bigger view. He sees the whole picture. He knows what's happening. He has a plan. It's unfolding the way that he wants it to. Uh, God doesn't make mistakes. God never allows trials to go to waste in our lives. And he never allows trials into our lives without a purpose. We sing that song, Rejoice in the Lord, that Ron Hamilton wrote. For when I am tried, then I shall come forth as gold. Isaiah chapter 48, verse number 10. God says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. God was allowing them to go through. Even though they didn't understand it, God was allowing them to go through a time of affliction and difficulty so they would be refined, so they would be prepared for better use in the service of the Lord. And as we go through trials, God desires for us to let him have his perfect and complete work in our hearts so that we can be better servants for him. That's God's purpose. And the affliction, as bad as it was, 
it led to Israel's growth. They began to grow. They multiplied. And as you begin to look at the words that are used there, it has the same exact meaning as a, as a swarm of bees. I was going to tell this story about a swarm of bees. Dad's not in here, so I'm going to skip that story because we're running behind this morning. But I rest assured there's a good bee story there. Uh, the plan of affliction. Yes, everybody just laugh and clap. Man, that was a wonderful story. Uh, the plan of affliction, it backfires in Pharaoh's face. He's going to afflict them. He's going to make the burden stronger. He's going to make the trials worse, but it backfires. He wants to stop the amount of people that are coming into the land of Israel, the amount of people that are being born. And you know, it's kind of this way. Uh, Scripture says uh, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And so uh, that's kind of what happened here with Pharaoh and the people of Israel. Where Satan tries to rule, God overrules. And where you have bondage in your life that you feel like it's just ruling your life, understand God can overrule what's happening. James chapter 1, the first few verses, we're encouraged to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, tests, trials, because the trying of your faith worketh patience. And it says, let patience have her perfect work. So she may be perfect, complete, So you'll be brought to maturity, entire, wanting nothing. Pressure in our lives. A lot of times we want to get away from it, but pressure can be a good thing. You look at how diamonds are created. You know what creates diamonds? An immense amount of pressure. I was watching a video the other day on Steinway Grand Pianos. Anybody in here ever played on Steinway? That would be Erica's dream to play on a Steinway piano. They're the most expensive pianos. In fact, they have one in their little museum that they have that's worth several million dollars. But Steinways are the granddaddy of all pianos. The care that they, there's only two facilities in the United States that make Steinway pianos. Go on YouTube, watch. It's fascinating to watch how they make these incredible pianos. I think the cheapest one starts at like $200,000. That's the, that's the low end for a Steinway grand piano. Uh, But the 88 strings uh, on one of their pianos exerts 45,000 pounds of pressure on the frame. That's 22 tons of pressure. But that pressure, it's needed to create beautiful music. If there was no pressure on those strings, you know what you'd hear? Yep, silence. It requires pulling and tension and stress to create the beautiful sound that you hear. And similarly, the pressure in our lives, you know, it can be the very thing that God uses to bring beauty and purpose to our lives. Second, it was a harmful culture. I told you, Joey, I told him last night, I'm cutting my slides down. There's no way I can get through these. I'm going to cut them down. I said, I cut them down. I still, I'm not going to get through them this morning. We're going to do our best. We may just have to make this an 11-week series and call it part two next week. Uh, It's a harmful culture. Uh, When you feel that you can't live for God in the midst of this culture, remember how God worked in the lives of the Hebrew children. Sometimes cultures that are hateful to the things of God, they can end up becoming harmful to the people of God. They take their animosity out on the people of the Lord. That's what will happen. So don't be surprised... If and when our culture here in the United States becomes harmful to the people of God. Because it's happened all throughout history. It's happening in other parts of the world now. So be prepared for it. Our trials that we go through, they will strengthen us or shackle us. They will build us or break us. They will increase our faith or diminish it. And so Pharaoh realized that his current plan to break the children of Israel by hard labor, this isn't working. So he's got to come up with a new plot. And he comes up with a hateful plot. And so Satan, he takes an all-out assault on the people of God in this next section. If we go down to verse number 15, Pharaoh gives an evil order to the Hebrew midwives uh, who were caring for the Hebrew women as they give birth. 
He commands the midwives to murder the children as they were coming out of the wombs. Verse 15, the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, uh, the name of one Shifra, the name of the other Pua. And, when he, and he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, you shall kill him. If it be a daughter, she shall live. And so Pharaoh makes a decision that completely goes against the heart of God for protecting life, for the sanctity of life, something that has been a hallmark of the people of God uh, from the beginning of time. Life is precious. Uh, There is value in all life. We look at what uh, is said in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse number 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Uh, When God speaks in the Bible of Jesus in his mother's womb, uh, the Bible recognizes that that is a human life. It's not a clump of cells. It's not anything else. That That is a human. When life begins at conception, you have life. And it is human life. It's nothing else. We're going through uh, in our creation series on Monday nights. We're, we're reading through a book written by Dr. David DeWitt. And that was his phrase that he used in one of the first chapters I read this past week. We say life begins at conception because at conception you have life. We all agree with that. There's nothing else that's going to be other than human life. You have a human life at conception. That seems pretty simple. But... It wasn't for these people, and it's still not for many people in our society today. But the people of God recognize the sanctity of life. In his book, Dr. David DeWitt, as I was reading this week, he said, many pregnant women are screened with serum tests and ultrasounds to determine uh, if the baby is carrying uh, Down syndrome, has other birth defects. And in scanning the scientific literature regarding such testing, one encounters, encounters the phrase therapeutic abortion. He says, it's rather ironic that any procedure that results in death would be called therapeutic. Boy, that's odd, isn't it? Then he goes on to say, according to a literature review from the United Kingdom, it's estimated that greater than 90% of babies that were prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome were terminated. Wow. Wow. The best available estimate for the United States is 67% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted rather than carried to term. And this is what's at the heart of the the creation-evolution debate. Is life special? Are we different? Or are we just animals? When asked whether or not it was civilized to abort babies with Down syndrome in this discussion, uh, Renowned evolutionist Richard Dawkins. I want you to see what he said. Yes, it is very civilized. These are fetuses diagnosed before they have human feelings. He goes on to say, abort it and try again. It would be immoral to bring it into the world if you have a choice. Those comments are reprehensible, are they not? That's a culture that does not know God. That is... That is what you get with a culture that says you are the product of millions and billions of years of evolutionary processes. In the United States, 19% of pregnancies end in abortion. 879,000 babies are murdered each year through abortion, approximately 2,400 a day. I was just looking uh, last night and I didn't get to update the graphic, but there's numbers that show this is even higher now. Since 1973's Roe v. Wade ruling, 64 million babies have been aborted. 58% of Americans believe abortion should be legal, and I read last night new polling data that they just did in the last week shows that number now is 61% of Americans believe that abortion should be illegal. Pray for your Supreme Court. We are hoping to see Roe v. Wade overturned in the next couple of weeks, maybe the next few days. But God places great value on the lives of unborn babies. But as a leader of a culture that didn't know God, Pharaoh's plotting to destroy the future generation through the murder of those babies. And I'm just going to go ahead. We're going to end it right there this morning because I still got quite a bit I want to cover and get through in this. And I don't think we would do justice to the rest of this chapter in the beginning of Exodus chapter 2 if we just try to rush through this and give you the highlights of it. Uh, so 
next week, unless I can think of more things to say, we'll, have a, we'll probably have a shorter uh, session time. Chad's like, no, nah, he'll, he'll still fill up the time some way. Uh, but begin thinking, and I would encourage you, read Exodus chapter 1 and Exodus chapter 2. I've read it through multiple times this week, just letting those words soak in on me about how this culture was anti-God, looking at the similarities between their culture and our culture, seeing how our culture is following right along with where Egypt was over 3,000, close to 4,000 years ago. Again, this is nothing new what we see happening. It's nothing new. This has been going on for centuries. And man, as I began to think about those uh, verse 8, how he didn't know God. I, you go on, I think, it was, uh, I think it was Hosea that said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Israel went through a lot of bad things over and over again in their history as you read through because they did exactly what Pharaoh, we can, I mean, we're talking about Pharaoh, how he was pagan, how he was anti-God, and he didn't understand the scriptures. He didn't understand what had happened with Joseph leading up before that. But the people of God, children of Israel, they failed. Hosea said, you're destroyed for lack of knowledge. They would go through these vicious cycles. They would serve God for a while. They would get on fire for God for a while. They would, they would love God for a while. And then they'd begin to let other things kind of pull them away from God. The importance of the word of God would kind of fall away in their lives. They weren't passing it on. And they end up in captivity. And it was just a cycle over and over and over through the Old Testament. I mean, they get delivered here out of the book of Exodus, but we know they're going to get sent into captivity again and again because they just go through this cycle where God tries to draw them back. And somehow, one generation to the next, they kind of lost. After this generation comes out of Egypt, they don't pass it on. In fact, this very generation, they're going to turn on God before we get to the end of the book of Exodus. They're going to turn on God. They're going to forget what God's done for them. And it leads to them wandering in the wilderness. So don't think that it's strange in our lives when things happen. Because sometimes we can be very much like the people of Israel. We live in a culture that can be very much like the culture of Egypt. And read through Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 2 as we uh, get ready for next week. Think this week. Uh, next week, I would like to have some interaction. So next Sunday, think of a time in your life when God used some sort of trial to help purify you and prepare you for service for him later on. I think most of us could probably have something. So if you're not scared to kind of share with the class, okay, let's do that next Sunday. I know there's a couple of you that have some stories about how Things happen in your life that now you can see that God had a purpose in that. So I know at least two or three of you have got those. I would like for you to, to kind of be ready to share that next Sunday. And then think about the ways that we see hatred toward Christians in our culture today. And brainstorm this week. Think about those and come back and see if you can connect the dots between the mindset of our culture and how it connects to a lack of knowledge of God. Because I think there's a connection between those two things. And then the third, the third thing, you didn't know you were going to get a bunch of homework. If three people do this, I'll be, I'll be so happy. Scan the headlines this week. Take a screenshot. If you see a headline this week that just kind of demonstrates culture's ignorance towards God or their spitefulness for the things of God and Christianity... If you see a news article, something like that, take a screenshot and send it to me. I want to I show a few of these on the screen next week to just kind of demonstrate here's where we're at in our culture compared with where Egypt was in their culture. But then don't let it get you too discouraged. Keep in mind Psalm 96.3, declare his glory among the heathen and realize that as they say, a light shines brightest in the middle of the darkest night. And we know that Jesus said we're supposed to be light. We're to be light and salt. We're supposed to be impacting the culture that we're in. 
So don't get too discouraged. Look through, though, if you can find some headlines. I mean, I saw a couple this week that I just screenshotted. I was like, man, that goes right with what, what we're going to be dealing with on Sunday. So if you see some, screenshot them, send them to me. We'll, we'll show a few of them on the screen next week and just kind of really get an idea of how uh, culture does that. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you would help us as we uh, live in a culture that is beginning to become uh, anti-Christian, Lord, a culture that may not be familiar with you. I pray that we would look for opportunities to declare your glory this week, that we would uh, be able to introduce people who are unfamiliar with your glory, Lord. I pray that we would seek out opportunities to share uh, a word of faith with them this week, God. I pray that you would help us as believers to recognize that affliction and trials in our lives uh, are never a mistake, that they are opportunities to serve you better. And so, Lord, I pray that we would, uh, as believers, that we would seek to have an outlook that understands the big picture, that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, and that you're always at work, and that the trials and the afflictions we go through are more ways to bring glory to you. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. I pray that you'd uh, be with us as we go into this morning's service. I pray that you'd meet with us in a special way. I pray that our hearts would be prepared for the preaching and the singing this morning, Lord. I pray that we would just worship you out of true hearts of love for all that you've done. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.